Uh, we're in today our second week of the Recovering Pharisee. The Recovering Pharisee. And if you weren't here last week, uh, we started the series off with a message called, You Might Be a Pharisee If. And what we learned is that many of us in this room, uh, even though we didn't know it, we are Pharisees. And hopefully because we found that out, we started recovering from being a Pharisee. And if you wouldn't hear, <coughs> that message will be available on the internet uh, sometime after church today. And so you can go back and catch up on where we are in the series. But today, uh, the title of the message is... The mushy middle. The mushy middle. And so we'll get around to that in just a second. Uh, but before we do that, would you pray with me and for me? Father, we, uh, we come to you this morning. And God, I realize that I can't do this on my own. God, I can't even talk this morning without coughing. And so God, I pray that you'd touch uh, my throat and my voice and help me to be able to speak your words today. Um, God, I pray that you would empty me of myself and that you would fill me up with your uh, Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you would open our eyes and our ears to hear your word this morning. And God, I pray that in these few moments together that our lives would be changed. God, that our hearts would be changed. Our perspectives would change about our lives. God, <coughs> we thank you for what you're doing in our church. God, we thank you for... 95 years of your faithfulness. God, help us not to get lazy or complacent, but help us to press on to further the kingdom of heaven. God, we love you this morning, and we thank you for everything. And it's through Jesus we pray. Amen. Um, before we can get into the scripture that I have for us today, I need to lay some groundwork so that we're all on an even playing field. And so for the next few moments, I want to explain this idea of cultural Christianity. And so some of you may have heard this, some of you may not, but hopefully we'll all have a good understanding of it uh, before the day's out. Uh, there's a couple different definitions floating around about what cultural Christianity is. And uh, the definition that we're going to use today is that a cultural Christian is some, someone who identifies with things that are Christian but they're not truly a follower of Christ, okay? And so, cultural Christians identify as Christians because the culture that they're a part of and not because they have a relationship with Christ. Uh, cultural Christians, it, it's more about their family and their upbringing than a personal conviction about Jesus raising from the dead. And so... What I mean by that is that uh, if you're a cultural Christian, you identify as a Christian because you were raised Christian. You were raised in a Christian home or you were raised um, by Christian parents. And so your whole life you have just said, yeah, I'm a Christian, but you have never actually made a decision to follow Jesus. Uh, cultural Christians um, are everywhere and it started... Um, in our nation's roots, okay? Uh, our nation has strong Christian roots from the discovery of North America. Uh, this part of the world has been heavily influenced by Christianity. And from the Quakers and the Puritans who moved here uh, to escape religious persecution uh, to the devout believers who were our founding fathers uh, who wrote all of our documents, they were all Christians and um, throughout its history, America has been heavily, heavily influenced by Christianity. And uh, I'm not going to give you a long history lesson. I just need you to track with me just a few more minutes, and then we'll get to something you want to hear about. Uh, in the late 1800s and in the early 1900s, America was, we experienced a large influence of Christianity um, with a, a time period that we know is uh, the revival, uh, revivalism time period or the second great awakening. And what that time was is when there was a series of large revivals through the nation uh, that really converted a lot of people to Christianity. Um, 
in this time period, Christianity kind of became the normal. Like everybody was a Christian. You just identified as a Christian if you were American. And uh, you might say that during this time period, Christianity became popular. It became the popular thing to do. Everybody was a Christian, not necessarily because they had a personal conviction about Christ, but just because everybody else was. Just because everybody else was a Christian, they identified as a Christian. And so over the last 100 years, uh, especially in our region, Christianity has become the social norm. It's what everybody does. It's what everybody expects. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, it became more of a cultural expectation than a personal conviction. It became something that you just did because everybody else done it. And what, it, what I mean by this is that 50 years ago, and, and I'm not that old obviously, but some of you are, and if you are, we appreciate you. But 50 years ago, uh, if you wanted to have a good social standing in the community, you had to be a Christian. Nobody would respect you, uh, or most people wouldn't respect you if you were not a Christian, if you were not a member of some kind of church. If you want to be, wanted to be accepted by friends and family, then you needed to be a Christian. <coughs> if you wanted to get hired on a good job, you needed to be identified with a church. If you wanted to run for a political office, you needed to be associated with the church. We're here in the Bible Belt, and some of those things are still true here. But Christianity during this time became a cultural expectation. Being a Christian was more of an obligation that you feel it became like the status quo. Uh, I know this is a slow start. Just stick with me. But here's the deal. Here's the deal. Cultural Christianity is dangerous. Cultural Christianity is dangerous because here's what it does. Cultural Christianity blurs the lines between those who truly follow Christ and those who don't. In a society where everybody acts like Christians, it's hard to tell the difference between those who are actually Christians and those who are not. When cri cultural Christianity becomes the norm, people begin putting their faith in church attendance rather than in Christ. It becomes part of the culture instead of part of who we are as individuals. In many parts of our country... Cultural Christianity is all but gone. In the Northeast, uh, nobody is a Christian to fit in. In the Northwest and on the West Coast, nobody is a Christian just to fit in. Uh, Christianity has experienced resistance in those areas. And because of that, uh, there's no longer what we call cultural Christians. People who go to church but who really don't know Christ. Um, <clears throat> here's what happened at one time. At one time, lost people came to church just the same as saved people because they felt a cultural expectation to do that. And so, because they had that expectation, they came to church and they heard the gospel preached and they got saved because they, were, they could hear the gospel. Now, it's no longer an expectation for everybody to go to church. And so, the church has been so used to that, that we stopped going out to reach people. We were just reaching people inside of our buildings. I'm going somewhere, I promise. I know it's slow. The church now, because cultural Christianity is fading, must go to lost people. We can't expect them to come to us. Getting people to come to church is not like it was 30 years ago. 30 years ago, you were expected to be at church somewhere. And now you're not. And so there's not that cultural pressure to bring people to church. But here, here's the danger of cultural Christianity. 
when everyone identifies as a Christian, very few people actually become one. When everyone identifies as a Christian, nobody actually, I don't want to say nobody, that's too strong of a word, very few people actually follow Jesus. And cultural Christianity creates this group that today we're going to call the mushy middle. The mushy middle. The mushy middle is a group of people found in our culture who identify as Christian for some other reason than having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They, uh, they identify as being a Christian because their family is a Christian. Their mom and dad were Christian. And so they just say, well, I guess I'm a Christian too because my family is Christian. Or they were raised in church. And so, yeah, I was raised in church. And so, of course, I am a Christian. They were part of a political party. Have you ever heard somebody identify a political party with uh, being a Christian or not? Some people believe because they have a certain set of morals or values that they are Christian. Some people believe because they do Christian things or agree with things that Christians do that they are Christian. Some people believe because they have Christian friends that they are a Christian. Um, but that's not the case. That's not the case. This group of people that we call the mushy middle, and uh, I, I just let you know that you could be in the mushy middle just because you're here today. You all are a great bunch of people, but you could be in the mushy middle. And the, here's the characteristics. Here's what identifies those people who are in this group. They agree that the Bible is good, but they are unwilling to apply it to their life. People in the mushy middle will say, yeah, I believe that that is God's word. I believe that that is true. But when it comes to them actually applying this book to their lives, they're not willing to do it. They're not willing to do it. Church becomes more social than spiritual. Church is a place where they come to see their friends and not a place where they come to have their lives changed. Celebrating, these people celebrate <coughs> and excuse sin in their lives and in the lives of others. They celebrate and excuse sin in their own lives and in the lives of others. They claim to be a Christian, but... They feel like sin is something to be celebrated. Don't get me wrong, church. Everybody messes up. Everybody makes mistakes. But we should never celebrate someone's mistake. We should never celebrate sin in another person's life because sin leads to death. Sin leads to death. And we should never celebrate that in our lives or in the lives of others. Or excuse it. Sometimes we want to excuse our sin. We especially want to excuse our sin. And we want to excuse the sin of the people we love. But we cannot celebrate or excuse sin in our lives or the lives of others. People in the mushy middle bend or manipulate scripture to fit their ideas and their culture. So they use scripture to excuse sin. They bend scripture to say, well, that's not really what that means. That's not really what I think about that. That's not really how I interpret it. But what they're doing is bending the word of God to fit their own agenda. Minimizing the fact that Jesus is the only way to heaven. People in the mushy middle want to avoid saying that at all costs. People uh, want to get around that in some way, somehow. But Jesus is, in fact, the only way to heaven. And the last thing is they are only marginally committed to Christ. Marginally committed to Christ. They are kind of committed. Like they're committed to the getting safe part, the free part, but they are not willing to give up their lives 
to serve Christ. This group of people look and talk and sometimes even walk like Christians, but their life has never been changed by Jesus Christ. They've never come into a personal relationship with the Savior. Their hearts have never been transformed and their lives have never, ever been changed. They live with a false sense of security that somehow because I come to church or because I do good things or because I dress in a certain way, I must be a Christian. These people are as lost as last year's Easter eggs, but they believe that because they come to church that they are all good with God. That is not the case. I'm not saying, I, I want to make this clear what I am and I am not saying, I'm not saying that, that people in the church who come and they get born again are losing what they had. What I am saying is that there's people living in the church or living as Christians elsewhere that believe they're Christians, but they've never accepted Jesus Christ. Okay, so once you're saved, once you've been saved by grace through faith and sealed by the Holy Spirit, you are saved forevermore. You cannot undo what Christ has done in your life. But you can live in a false sense of security, believing you are all good with God when you have never had your sins paid for and your heart changed. The mushy middle wants to live with one foot in the world and one foot in the church. They want to reap the benefits of being a believer while experiencing the pleasures of sin for a season. They want to live out here through the week and over here on Sunday morning. They want to reap the benefits of believing in Jesus, but they do not want to leave their old life behind them. They're neither here nor there. They're unwilling to give their life to Christ because they still want to live their own way. Did you know when you get saved, Romans 10, uh, 9 and 10, I think it is. They don't have this back here, but it says, <coughs> Anyone who believes in their heart, that Jesus raised from the dead and confesses him as Lord is saved. Did you know Jesus is not just your Savior, but he's your Lord? That means he has veto power in your life. That means that he has control of your life and where he tells you to go, you go. And what he tells you to do, you do. If someone is your Lord, they have control. You can't control your own life and follow Jesus. You have to go where he leads. You know, so many times we want to invite Jesus to follow us. We want Jesus to go with us, but we want to be in the lead. That's not how this works. Jesus calls us to follow him. He has to be in the seat of power. He has to be in the seat of control. Matter of fact, we're going to talk about that next week if you want to come back. Uh, here's what I'm getting at this morning. Being an American does not make you a Christian. Being Republican or Democrat does not make you a Christian. Owning a gun is a good idea, but it does not make you a Christian. I know people who believe because they believe in the Second Amendment that they think they're all good with God. Your mom taking you to church all of your life does not make you a Christian. Your mom and dad being Christians does not make you a Christian. Going to church does not make you a Christian. Having good morals and good ethics does not make you a Christian. I know people who are, are way more moral than I am, that are lost, undone. They, ha they live great lives. They're awesome. I wish I could live lives like they do, but they remain lost. People who are honest and good, 
who wouldn't steal from you if, it, if it, their life depended on him. But yet, they will not give their life to Christ to be saved. Being a good person does not make you a Christian. Going on mission trips will not make you a Christian. Reading the Bible, you should do that, but it will not make you a Christian. Giving money to the church is a terrific idea, but it will not make you a Christian. Being a church member will not make you a Christian. None of those will put you in right standing with God. None of that will set you right. None of that will pay for your sin. None of that will satisfy the requirement that God has put on your life. In John 3, a man named Nicodemus comes to Jesus. It's the middle of the night and... What you need to understand about Nicodemus is that he was a religious leader. He wasn't just religious, but he was a religious leader. He was among the top people in Judaism of this time. And no doubt he had stronger morals and values than you and I have. He, his whole life was consumed with following and knowing the law of God. He probably had the entire Old Testament memorized. I barely have John 3.16 memorized. And this man probably had the whole Old Testament memorized. He comes to Jesus and he starts talking about all the great signs that Jesus is performing. And he says... Sir, I, there's no doubt that you are from God. Because of the signs you were doing, nobody else could do them if they, would, if they were not from God. And you see, that's what cultural Christians want to do. They want to talk about all the good things Jesus done, but they don't want to talk about the fact that they need a Savior. They want to talk about how great of a teacher Jesus was, but they don't want to say, I'm a sinner lost and in need of a Savior. But Jesus, uh, Nicodemus is trying to talk about good works and bad works. And Jesus, he, he cuts through of all of that. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Becoming a follower of Jesus is not about going to church. It's about becoming born again. It's not about following a set of rules. If rules would have got you into the kingdom, Nicodemus would have got in. Nicodemus would have been first in line, but that's not what it's about. <coughs> it's about being born again. You cannot get into heaven unless you are born again. Again, identifying as a Christian, saying, hey, I'm a Christian, does not make you born again. That's not what it requires. Coming to church does not make you born again. You may be saying, what does it mean to be born again? And that's exactly what Nicodemus said. He said, can I enter again into my mother's womb? For I'm an old man. Jesus said, you don't understand you're born once by your mother. And then if you want to be born again, you're born again of the Spirit. It's a spiritual rebirth. It's your heart is changed. You see, we are dead in our trespasses and in our sins before Jesus comes into our life. We are dead to God. We are separated from God. And nothing can reconnect us to God that we can do. Christianity and going to church cannot reconnect you to God unless you're born again. Doing Christian things, listening to Christian music, going to Christian places cannot reconnect you with God. It has to be through the person and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Christianity is not about the good things that we can do, but it's about the perfect life that Jesus lived so that while he was on this planet. 
Christianity is not about us trying to do good things to pay for our sin, but it's about the perfect sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. Christianity is not about us jumping through hoops, but it's about Jesus satisfying every, every demand that God put on him in our place. Christianity is not about bad people becoming good people. Christianity is about dead people coming back to life, being reborn in Jesus Christ. Christianity is not about a code of morals or values that we try to follow. But it's about us following this man named Jesus who we have come to believe is the Christ, the Son of the living God who came and paid our price, died in our place, and raised back up from the dead. It's not, it's not about us. We want to make this all about us. But it's not about us. It's about Jesus. <coughs> it's about going where Jesus went. And doing what Jesus did. It's about following Jesus, not following a set of rules. Christianity is not about going to church. It's about being the church. And as you know, Christianity is not about being at Bond Baptist's 95th homecoming. It's about a homecoming that we will have one day. When Jesus returns and comes and gets us. And we'll have a homecoming on the other side of glory. That's what it's about. It's not about now. Christianity is not about us expanding our kingdom, our personal kingdom or the kingdom of Bond Baptist Church. It's not about growing this church. It's about growing the kingdom of heaven. Christianity is not about one individual church, but it's about the church universal growing and expanding to make the name of Jesus great on this planet. We serve a king that is matchless in all of his ways. And he has a kingdom to which there will be no end. Christianity is not really about us at all. It's about Jesus and what he's done. It's about making our lives all about Jesus. Making Jesus the focus, the center point of our life. It's all about Jesus. It's all about the cross. And when we make it about ourselves, we make it about the wrong things. Christianity starts when we realize that we are hopelessly lost and helpless without Jesus. That's where it all starts. And then we see Jesus invade our situations and save us. From ourselves. I want to read you a little bit of scripture this morning from Ephesians 2, and this is the gospel as plain and simple as you can get it. In Ephesians 2, starting in verse 1, it says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power. Of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our bodies and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Sounds like a pretty hopeless situation, don't it? Lost, undone, following our own way. But verse 4 says this. But God, but God, I'm thankful that God butted in, ain't you? But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. And raised us up with him. And seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith. 
And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Not a result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Do I need to reread that? Did you all hear what I just read? We were dead in our trespasses. D E A D, dead. In our trespasses and sins. Did you know a, a dead person can't help their self? Nobody, you don't ever see a dead person playing their own funeral, do you, Brody? <laughs> dead people can't help their self. You could not help yourself. You could not do anything to improve your situation. You could not do anything to get back from God. You were dead. Dead. Unable to pay for your own sin. We walked and talked like the world. We done what we wanted to do. We followed our own bodies and our own minds. We were dead and we were enemies of God. But instead of God giving us what we deserved, which was more death, it says, but God who is rich in mercy, for which the, by, by the love which with he looked. Let me go back and I'll read it to you. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us when we were dead in our trespasses and sin, made us alive together with him in Christ Jesus. He made you alive when you were dead. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are no longer dead, but you are alive in Jesus Christ. <coughs> and not just that. It would have been good enough if it had stopped there. It would have been good enough if that's all he had done. But it says that he raised us up and seated us with Christ Jesus in heavenly places. He gave you a place of honor instead of a place of death. He gave you a seat of honor instead of a seat of shame. He gave you what you did not deserve. Not just held back what you did. He gave us mercy and His grace. He gave us His Son that we did not deserve to pay the price that we could not pay. And then... Paul tells us that it was all by grace and through faith, not by anything we earned, not by anything we done. It was all by God's unmerited favor towards us. When we accept that sacrifice, when we've been washed in the blood of Jesus and we've been forgiven of all of our sins, it says that we're made in His workmanship. We're made like Christ. And that we're created for good works. When you become a believer, good works will come out of you. When you become a believer, you will not continue in the life that you once lived. You will mess up. You will fall short. But you will be different. You will be different you will walk in a different pathway than you once walked we used to walk with the world and now we walk with Jesus our hearts and our our lives they're changed when you become a believer your heart becomes righteous it becomes as righteous as Jesus is righteous but your body is still wicked and it is still sinful and so we spend our whole lives Becoming more and more like who we really are. Your spirit is righteous. Your spirit is holy. But your body is still being perfected. It's still being made into the image of Christ. And so today, I said all that to say this. If you found yourself in the mushy middle today. Maybe you came into church believing that you were all squared away with God because of something you done, because of something your parents done, because of something, maybe because you 
went to church all your life. You believed that you were saved, and now you realize you've never made a decision to follow Jesus. Maybe you're here today, and this has all kind of hit you like a freight train, but you've realized that you've never really accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. I want to invite you today that you can be saved today. Maybe you never understood what it meant to be saved. Maybe you've been in, your whole, been in church your whole life and never accepted Christ. Today can be your day. Today can be the day that your life changes. Today can be the day that, that everything begins to look different for you. Today can be the day that's the first day of the rest of your life. Following Jesus starts with realizing there is nothing you can do to save yourself. And then you have to ask Christ to forgive your sins, to become your Savior, and not just your Savior, but your Lord. And so today the band's getting ready to come up and play. And I want to I wanna ask you today, are you born again are you born again have you ever accepted Christ as your personal savior have you been hiding behind going to church have you been hiding behind religious activity have you been running away from God because you knew deep down in your heart all along that there was nothing different about you Today, if that's you, if you want to accept Christ, in just a moment, I'm going to say a prayer. And this prayer is not magic. It's not uh, anything special. But it's just a model for you to pray after. And so you can pray after me. You can say just what I say. But as long as you mean it, as long as you're really giving Jesus your life, as long as you're authentic. Jesus will save you. It won't cost you anything but your life. It won't cost you anything but your life. And so, if with every eye, eye closed and every head bowed today, I, I'm going to pray, and you can just pray after me if, that, if that's where you are today. Father, I realize I'm a sinner. And I realize that I can't save myself. Today I'm in need of your grace and your forgiveness. Forgive me of my sin and wash me clean. I need you to be my Savior and I need you to be my Lord. Guide me through the rest of my life and help me to follow you every step of the way. In Jesus' name, Amen.